All right, well, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Justin Wilson, for joining us uh, tonight for a Dionysius uh, Circle uh, discussion. Uh, so Dr. Wilson uh, is at Princeton University, uh, where he's a postgraduate research associate uh, in the Department of Art and Archaeology. Um, Dr. Wilson specializes in medieval art with a focus on Byzantium and Russia. And um, uh, I understand you're currently working on a monograph um, called The Moods of Early Russian Art uh, from 14th to 16th centuries. Um, but today we're going to focus on um, one of your recent articles uh, called Theophanies of Nicaea and the Diagram that Draws and Erases Itself. And, uh, and, and so Theophanies of Nicaea was a bishop of Nicaea and um, I guess a faithful but discriminatory disciple of uh, St. Gregory of Palamas. And um, in, in, in this article, Dr. Wilson focuses on a series of um, uh, a series of diagrams of the Trinity uh, done by uh, Theophanes. And, um, and yeah, so uh, thank you very much for uh, joining us, uh, Dr. Wilson. Thanks so much for, for having me, um, Sam, and for, for that nice introduction. And I've really enjoyed being a part of the, the reading group. So it's a, it's a real pleasure just to share a little bit of the research that I've been doing with you all, in particular, kind of the reception of, of, of Dionysius in later Byzantium. So um, what I want to do tonight really is uh, kind of introduce some of the broader landscape of, of diagrams. Um, and just close that real quickly. Um, and talk a little bit about how the project started and how Theophanes relates to some of his contemporaries and predecessors and, and to kind of isolate what is unique about what he's doing in his take, which is um, in line with the thematic of the book, uh, the reading group is really a reception of, of, of Neoplatonic philosophy and ideas and application of philosophy to Trinitarian arguments in the wake of debates over the filioque, which is a term I'll be using a lot, which simply means um, the disputes between the Catholic and Orthodox churches about the procession of the Holy Spirit. Um, so I'll talk for roughly 35, 40 minutes, and you all should feel free to interrupt me, um, ask for clarifications, and we can kind of slow down and pause over things uh, as we go and then talk more fully at length in the Q&A at the end. Uh, the outline of the talk is, I'll provide a little bit of a background about other theologians, roughly 12th to 15th century, who were diagramming the Trinity, and a little bit about their relationship to works of art, which is a kind of side project. It's the initial um, paper that got me interested in diagrams, and that's a essay that's really focused towards uh, medieval studies audience. And this one's going to be a little bit more of uh, Byzantine studies focused audience because um, it does present a new unedited text and uh, images of the manuscript, which basically haven't been been seen before. So it, it required a little bit more of a focus study. And, and then I'll introduce Theophanes and I'll talk a little bit about how his diagrams might be uh, viewed in line with painting. And partly that's because of my disciplinary specialty as an art historian first and foremost. Um, so the background, the, pod, the project began with my research in 15th to 16th century Muscovite art, and particularly one of the authors, Maxime Grec, who was an Athenite theologian, who was called to Moscow in 1516 to help with translating the Psalter into Slavonic. And Maxime has a series of letters, one of which he's writing to Fedor Karpov, who's a German over there in the Chancery, and describes a set of uh, Trinitarian diagrams of an equilateral triangle inscribed in a circle to, uh, to his interlocutor and calls them uh, flat out just heretical and blasphemous and not in line with the Orthodox tradition. And then specifically he criticizes uh, this individual, Nicholas Bulo, for flipping the equilateral triangle upside down, whereas he should have drawn it if he were to do so right side up and i just became interested in where this diagram was coming from is it catholic is it orthodox what what is the sort of tradition in byzantium and post-byzantine uh, 
world, Slavic world in particular, of the diagram? What is its status? Why is Maxime reacting so um, vehemently to this practice? And I discovered a lot of different things um, which hadn't been uh, talked over in the scholarship and some of the stuff which hadn't been edited, like Theophanes' text. Um, but I want to kind of give you a glimpse of the ways that uh, the Byzantines talked about diagrams and how they saw them. And this will help you to understand, I hope, kind of the uniqueness of what Theophanes is doing and why his take, which is very pseudo-Dionysian, is, is quite unique, actually. So uh, the story begins with uh, Nikitas of Maronia in the 12th century. He's actually drawing on an earlier author who I won't talk about, um, Eustratius of Nicaea, who is a late 11th century, early 12th century theologian. Um, but Nikitas is interesting because he introduces a few terms which are quite important for Theophanes. Um, so this diagram appears in his uh, dialogues. There are six of them. And this appears in the second dialogue. And the dialogue is a conversation between a Latin and a Greek theologian. And uh, Nikitas introduces the language of the mesos and the acra, or the mean and the extremes in the Trinity. And he does so in order to talk about how each person, the three persons of God, can be understood as a mesos between two acra, or two extremes. Um, and the diagram that I'm showing you on the screen, you have the father at the top, the alpha um, to our left is beta for the sun, and to our right is uh, gamma for the Holy Spirit. And this format goes back to Eustratus and Nicaea, and it just carries forward and gets picked up by three or four different authors who play with it and um, play with similar terms, introduce other terms, as I'll sort of talk about. But this basic format um, first appears in this manuscript. Um, in the passage where he's laying this out, and this is actually the Catholic um, theologian. So Nikitas is interesting because he's orthodox, but he actually argues for the filio quae in favor of it without committing himself to then saying we should alter the creed as uh, the Orthodox Church. So he actually has the Latin interlocutor winning. And that's something that has a lot of um, political ramifications, which you can kind of talk about. But I'll just bracket that for right now. He introduces a subdivision in the passage where he says that when you say that each person is a mean in between two extremes, you can talk about a primary mean and you can talk about a non-primary mean. And this is actually something still of an open question in my mind, where he's getting these terms from and exactly what he means. But he does go on to offer an illustration. Um, and it has a couple steps to it. So in step one, he says, uh, let's imagine that there are two points, one at the father alpha and another one at the sun beta. And we imagine them moving down the sides of the triangle to the spirit gamma. And then on the other hand, if we imagine alpha and gamma, two points there for the father and spirit moving down the sides of the triangle to the sun. In both of these cases, he says, they can be called um, not primary. And then he alternatively in step two, imagines two sets of uh, point starting at the alpha, the father, and then moving down the sides of the triangle to the sun and the spirit through the father's begetting of the sun and his processing of the spirit. And he says, in this case, because they become more distant, they're primary. Whereas in the first case, they're not primary because they're becoming closer. I haven't found any really good late antique source. My sense is that this is a argument that comes from late antiquity, perhaps the church fathers. Um, I've kind of gone looking for that, but it's not exactly clear to me what he's arguing, except for the motivation is clear, which is that he's trying to establish terminology within sort of a mathematical uh, form of argument by which you can make distinctions between three terms, three points, all of which he has to, because of the dogmatic basis of his whole argument, um, he has to say that they're equal, they're ontologically equal, even if they're not numerically 
um, identical. And so primary and non-primary seems to be a way of saying we can differentiate between these two acra um, as being on either side of the mesos. And that importantly, crucially, this terminology can be uh, applied to each of the three points. At the very end of his argument, he then offers a reading of the diagram. And this is, this is nice because it sort of shows how he's uh, situating the Trinity within a relational ontology. And he says, uh, the Latin speaker says to his interlocutor, whatever point you take as the middle leaves the other two to be thought of as extremes. And each of them can be understood as both a middle and an extreme. And whichever you might understand as a middle, imagining the other two as extremes you have not slighted either. Therefore, take my symbols, and that's an important term within the pseudo-Denisian context, to be of the mean and extremity and the trinity. So the relevance for, for Theophanes to kind of uh, look ahead is that he both introduces the language of Mesos, which gets picked up by Theophanes and others, and he has a very mathematical, graphic, geometrical sense of how he's trying to diagram the trinity. But it does seem interestingly, to be motivated by this interconfessional debate. So the second author that um, is interesting to think about as a precedent to Theophanes is um, this really obscure theologian, Hieromont Kyrotheus from Asia Minor, who's working in the late um, 13th century, so during the time of the Latin occupation of Constantinople. And he has several sets of dialogues as well. Um, in which he is a speaker, and he's talking to two Catholic interlocutors. Sometimes they're given the names Nephon and Luke. And um, here at Theus's texts were, they've really only been studied since the 1980s. There's an important French article by Gabriel Pataxi, and then the texts were recently edited by um, a Greek scholar, um, Ioannides. So these are very, very new texts um, that haven't really been known. So uh, you just muted Justin. Mm -hmm. What am I doing here? <laughs> Sorry, I think I accidentally muted you instead of. Sure. Uh, can you hear me? Can, no. can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. yeah Sorry, sorry about, about that. that. I wanted to ask. Um, can you just clarify who Niketas and uh, who this new guy is, as far as their um, what century they're from and uh, I think they're, are they both Catholic? No, 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 uh, uh, Nikitas is, yeah, Nikitas is, is Orthodox. Greek. He's the bishop of, um, Maronia, and he is, uh, writing in Thessalonica in the late 12th century. Kiramont Kyrathaeus, again, Greek. Um, all the people I'll be talking about are, are, are Greek Orthodox. Okay. Um, but I did say here among Kyrathes is writing during the time of the Latin occupation of Constantinople. So in other words, the Fourth Crusade in the 13th century. Um, so uh, what I'm showing you on the, on the screen is a set of diagrams in um, one of here, here among Kyrathes' manuscripts, which basically look like a Venn diagram, the top and the bottom, and show inter interlocking rings, relations between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I, I won't talk specifically about those. The one I will talk a little bit later about is this one in the middle, which is the type of Latin diagram that Hieromont Hierotheus and others coming after him are trying to refute. And this goes back to um, a few centuries earlier where um, Eustratius of Nicaea had also refuted this diagram. What it shows is um, the Father on the left, labeled alpha, the sun, and the, the sun in the middle, labeled beta, and the spirit on the right, labeled gamma. And they're sometimes turned vertically, uh, but oftentimes they're shown horizontally just as a sort of space-saving measure on the page. So they usually talk about the father, quote unquote, being at the top, and the spirit being at the bottom, and the sun being in between them. And I'll talk about why that rectilinear or vertical um, arrangement is important. Nephon and Luke in the text introduce their, um, their diagram arguing that uh, there's no middle, there's no sense in which the spirit can be a middle between the father and the son, which if you'll recall is exactly the type of 
um, position that Nikitas had uh, endorsed when he said, you can imagine each one of these points is a mesos between two acra. This is, a, this is a, even though Nikitas is sort of accepting some of the Latin terminology, he's not accepting that point that, 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 that you cannot talk about a middle in the sense of um, the spirit. So um, the types of diagrams that Hierotheus uses to refute this argument are, once again, triangles and circles and equilateral triangles in, in specific. Uh, and in this diagram, um, he gives, he adds to Nikitas's alpha, beta, and gamma, and also adds um, alpha omega for the father as the processor, beta psi for the son as the logos, and gamma chi for the spirit as the processor. And so these terms are, um, can you see my cursor? Yeah, so these terms are, here's the, the gata chi, uh, gamma chi, beta psi for logos, and um, Alpha Omega for, for, for the father as the processor. So he adds these terms, and these go back to patristic terminology for the Godhead. So Gregory of Nazianzus is where uh, Hierotheus is getting this terminology from, and it does appear in Nikitas as well. He just doesn't specifically diagram that. Uh, what's most interesting is that Hierotheus is, he's not, he's not a sort of high-level philosopher, but he does like to use philosophical language for his polemical ends. So he has what he calls syllogisms, and um, he has six of them, where he uses all six of these terms, and they're highly repetitive phrases, almost like sort of mesmerizing uh, incantations in which he talks about the relations of each person and sort of reads around, uh, using the circles, reads around the different points of the triangle to talk about how basically the interrelatedness or perichoresis of the persons makes them an interlocking being so that you cannot therefore diagram the trinity as a, as a discrete rectilinear axis. And I've put on the screen just the last two for the spirit. And what he's doing is he's basically saying that you can, you can like Nikitos, you can read each one of the points as a mesos, uh, a beginning, a middle, and an end, moving around the circles. And he writes the syllogisms for the, for the spirit around the acts, around the circumferences of the son's circle and the father's circle to show how they're interrelated and to show how the understanding the one depends upon an understanding of the other. But these aren't really syllogisms in a philosophical sense. They're more like rhetorical uh, discursive moods, uh, discursive moods. Why this is interesting from the art historical point of view is where I'll end this sort of survey of, of, of earlier diagrams before I get on to, to Theophanes, um, is because of how people like Hierotheus read icons in line with the formal properties of their diagrams. So towards the end of his dialogue, um, Theophanes refers his opponents to the story of Abraham's feast for the three angels of the Oaks of Mamre in the book of Genesis chapter 18. And he quotes uh, a well-known passage in the, a text by Pseudo-Athanasius where he says, quote, unquote, it is evident with the three men seated before Abraham that the Holy Spirit was seated at his, i.e. the father's left, for this is his special seat, so he's talking about this angel. Um, just as he says to the son, sit at my right hand, quoting the Psalms, it's to be understood that the son being seated on his right, he says alternately to the spirit here, sit at my left hand. And this directional language in the book of Psalms, which a philosopher would say, well, there's no real sense in which there's a right hand or left hand of God, even though the Bible speaks that way, allows him to make an argument about how iconographers quote unquote correctly depict the angels on icon on icons and it therefore also provides him a way to talk about diagramming the trinity and so he goes on to say 
quote, for having pictured in my mind the three men whom Abraham feasted as seated at a table, my understanding was illuminated by them. I unveiled the sense of the diagram. And diagramming for Herotheus is not um, simply copying icons, but it is interestingly a parallel intellectual project. So he's, he's reading the, the book of Psalms and he's also squaring it with what he knows about how rhetorical diagrams are drawn. Um, and he goes on to say, quote, for in the same way that the painter schematizes the trinity on the panel, not according to a rectilinear form, as those who incorrectly diagram do, but as a triangle formed by three embracing circles, we graphically depicted it. And the icon showing the angels in a circular triangle format, therefore he reads as um, a sort of independently, independently established uh, refutation of the rectilinear um, diagram, which I showed you before. So this is his sort of argument that he mobilizes for diagrams, and then sort of he he also sort of helps himself to iconography. And and as an art historian, this was interesting to me too, um, because there's a very strong tradition of reading icons through formal um, analyses. And I'm showing you a, an influential reading of the same icon, which is, is by Andrei Rublev, um, and it's from the early 15th century, so here Theus couldn't have known it, but there, there are lots of this form of icon in Byzantium, and the iconography itself goes back to early Christian times, where it quite clearly didn't seem to have a polemical significance. This is a rereading of iconography in line of in light of uh, much later debates, but this is a this is an influential um, book by Rudolf Michael, which he reads this diagram through almost exactly the same basic schematic form as Herotheus does, although he doesn't know about the, the diagram. So it was, to me, kind of interesting to sort of uh, look back at this tradition of formalist um, art history in the 20th century in light of the diagrams. And the same thing you could do for um, rectilinear icons, which for for several decades, people have wondered, well, is this an affirmation of the filioque? Is this a Catholic looking diagram if we show the the father with the son seated in his lap and the spirit below? Does this sort of mean that the spirit processes through the son? And that's how some people have read it. And that is certainly how Herotheus would have read it, although it doesn't necessarily have to mean that. So it's a way of sort of nuancing the iconographic positions, the theological positions that, that some viewers could have seen into icons, even if the icon painter himself didn't intend them. So, but I'll, I'll put a pause right there for a second. Is, if you all want to talk any, talk about any of the things I just sort of mentioned before we get on to theophanies, because I, I covered a lot of ground and kind of brought in icons there at the end, and um, there's kind of a lot packed into that, but if there's anything you wanted to comment on or or ask. Yeah. So, so it seems like it's important. Um, I'm just thinking ahead in relation to Theophanies, right? That in for both um, Nicetta and uh, Herotheus. Um, sorry if I mispronounced mm -hmm. that. Um, it seems like for both of them, it's important that you can construe uh, any of the persons as the middle. Whereas, I'm sorry to look ahead, but like with Theophanies, yeah. you know, that kind of, that's kind of a difference where with Theophanies, there's really only one proper middle, which is the sun, right? Exactly. No, yeah, that's exactly right, Sam. And that's the really peculiar thing about Theophanies. And it's, it's precisely what I wanted you to kind of see is that he's both accepting the uniqueness of the middle as the sun without accepting the rectilinear format. Why he's doing that, it's not 100% clear. I think it does have to do with his reading of John, uh, John Vecos, the Latin patriarch of Constantinople in the uh, late 13th century, and his epigraphoi, which I just sort of briefly mentioned in the article. Um, but he, he's sort of carved out a different way of talking about the middle, which could be construed as supporting the filioque, and yet he doesn't 
allow them that. So I think how they're understanding the muscles for these guys, it's very much kind of an Aristotelian. We're reading the muscles. And if you talk about a muscle, you have to talk about two acra. And that's going to lead you to a to either a triangle or it's going to lead you to a rectilinear format. And that's basically the only way you can do that. Theophanes takes the muscles, allows it to be a kind of uniquely sun-oriented, second person of the Trinity-oriented term without then taking on board the language of the opera as well. Um, and that you know, leads them to this concentric circles. One other kind of question is like, does Theophanes know these diagrams? And it's hard to see how somebody that's as educated as T was when these things are, they're not rare. All of these authors, even though they're in Asia Minor or Thessalonica, they're all delivering their orations in Constantinople. So these things are well known. It seems like he's sort of silently suppressing his knowledge, whereas all these other authors very explicitly quote one another. Okay. Um, so. Yeah. And would you also say, like, I mean, just very roughly, like, um, the the sort of difficulty, as it were, for either the tri for the triangular, I guess, I guess, leaving aside the rectilinear, but when it comes to the triangular um, kind of diagrams, the difficulty there is establishing the the distinction of the persons. It's it's good at conveying the ontological equality. Um, but when it comes to really distinguishing the persons, that it seems like the diagram is not so, the triangle, the triangular diagram is not so good at conveying. Um, you think that's right to say or? I think so, especially because if you want to bring in the term of perichoresis or the interrelation or intermingling of the persons, the, the triangle very clearly and um, specifically, like this type of diagram, very, very effectively conveys that. I mean, you're sort of lost in the mesmerizing dance of rings, and and and, and literally, graphically, it's depicting, it's asking you to read about the spirit through the son and father, and you know, vice versa, the father through the spirit and and son and so forth. So it effectively conveys that. The Alphonse diagram actually doesn't very well convey that. He's more interested in the prohodos and the epistrophe, which is a very Neoplatonic. Mm -hmm. So I think if he wanted to talk about perichoresis, he would have needed to find a better illustration. Mm -hmm. But then that might have led him to conceptions on his terminology, the mesos and the, and the acra. So I think, I think so. I think they're, they're working in different intellectual climates. His is very much a late 14th century. This is um, a kind of different time and place. And uh, and, and he's not writing a dialogue either, even though he, he is writing a, a treatise. Mm -hmm. So I think also these diagrams are, oh, you're going to give me that type of rectilinear diagram? Let me give you this one and um, show you why this diagram beats that diagram. Okay. Um, Great. So, when you yeah. say uh, it doesn't show the differences as much, do you mean qua the father as the RK is not secured? with this idea that you can get the middle, any, any person can be a middle? Because it seems like he's wanting to say the differences are there and you get the perichoresis that they're all sort of equally entwined. But is the problem that it's not securing the father as the unique principle because he can also be seen as a middle? Is that? Yeah, and I think, I mean, I would say that, especially in Nikitas, the differences are much clearer with the articulation of the primary extremes and the non-primary extremes, where the father is the primary, generates the primary extremes because he's the begetter and the processor. Whereas when you follow his argument about moving closer, it's, it's not exactly clear. I mean, unless there's some kind of robust sense that I haven't come across in like school books of primary and non-primary in geometry, Euclid, and, and this, it, it could be there. It's not exactly clear to me how convinced his interlocutor would have been, even though, of course, in the, in the, uh, in the debate, he wins. Um, but I, so I think it's much clearer to me how Nikitas upholds the differences. 
it's a little bit less clear, I think, when you get to Heratheus, except for that he does have the advantage of pushing back against this, what he calls blasphemous rectilinear diagram. And so there's sort of a pushback, whereas Nikitas doesn't talk about, um, his opponent doesn't offer him a, con a, 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 a contrasting diagram. But I, there is a difference in that, of course, the father is put at the top. And that's, you know, going back to Maxim Grec, where, you know, Latin, Latin theologians regularly flip it upside down, like um, Henri Sousa does, who was read by Nicholas of Cusa. Mm -hmm. So there's an upside down diagram there. And there's also an upside down one in, in Nihilus Cavacillus, and he refutes that in the same, about the same time as the author in his late 14th century. So there is a difference in that very clearly the father is a monarchy and he's at the top. And th so that, that does convey a sort of sense of ontological or, or causal primacy, not ontological superiority, but causal primacy, I think. So it is there, but it's not as emphasized kind of with a mathematical argument. Right. Um, yeah. Whereas I think perichoresis is kind of emphasized with a graphic argument. So I was going to ask, um, you mentioned that in your article, especially that um, Theophanes uses the, his diagrams as a polemical piece, and this is quite an interesting idea to people in philosophy. We're not we're not used to seeing art used in argumentative form. So before mm -hmm. we move on to discussion of Theophanes, could you just mention if you've found any other instances of this, or what your impressions, your first impressions are art, uh, your first impressions are on art as a polemical tool. Yes, I, I, for the diagrams in particular, these, there are degrees of polemics, and Theophanes is actually quite tame. I mean, he's, he, he's, he's not, like, if, if, if you read the text, the, the, the translation, it's, it's, not, it's not sort of mean. Whereas sometimes in Heratheus, he, he kind of borders a little bit more on kind of, I mean, not name calling. These aren't like mean, mean popular texts. They're, they're easy Greek for the most part. They're not, they're not being read by the masses. Um, you do have sometimes kind of, they're not broad sheets, but they are single sheets that just have like a diagram and some of the metaphors used like in Pseudodionysius that, that traveled probably independently and might have been known to kind of popular preachers. And they may have used them in, in, in sort of our term of polemics. So um, polemics in the sense of a, um, a dogmatic defense against what is perceived as blasphemous doctrines. And, our, and my interest is in the intersection of theological texts and um, relatively high, uh, well-trained, well-schooled individuals who work in a somewhat high intellectual register, not necessarily their vocabulary is difficult, um, and how they could have steered people to read icons through their um, concocted diagrams. And then the sort of more popular ap application of diagrams to, to, to imagery as you, can, as you can kind of trace that. But that, that oftentimes as a historian is very difficult to kind of trace, like what, what does the average person believe? And, and, and you're kind of left to speculation there. Um, Just, does that answer your question? Very good, yes. I don't want to bog you down. Could you just maybe say real quick who this Eustratius guy was, who you said was the source of this whole triangular inscribed in the circle diagram, is that? Sure, yeah. Um, and then we can move on, so. Yeah, sure. I have a, I have a, let me just end it real quickly here and just pull it up, because I, I can show this to you real quick and, and answer your question. So uh, let me go back to screen share here. All right, so sorry, I just didn't want to flip through like 50 slides there. Um, so here's, this will answer your question hopefully in just like a two minute response. So we don't have, the reason I didn't show you Eustratius is because his diagram was never drawn probably, but it appears in a text which was just rec recently read it by, um, edited by Alexei Barmin, who's at the Russian Academy of Sciences. Um, and it appears in his third and final um, discourse on the Holy Spirit, which was written circa 1105 in refutation of the Milanese bis bishop um, 
Peter Grossolanos. And he puts the father at the top and the son at the bottom right from the father's uh, perspective and the spirit at the bottom left. He doesn't want to draw on the base because he thinks that would commit him to precisely the type of argument that Nikitas and Herotheus, where you have all of them sort of being ontologically triangulated. So he doesn't want to draw on the base and he also then puts a circle around it, but it doesn't get illustrated in this version, which is specifically cited by Mark of Ephesus at the Council of Florence and Ferrara in 1438. So Mark obviously knows Eustratius. Eustratius is a very popular theologian. And he repeats basically the exact same argument that Eustratius does, but doesn't go into the circle and doesn't go into why he doesn't draw on the base. And that's the text that pops up at the Council of Florence and Ferrara. Um, so Eustratius is very important for a lot of different reasons. And he is reading Proclus. He's writing commentaries on Pindar. And uh, I don't know, sorry, that's, that's, that's Eustathius. He's highly educated and is writing commentaries on um, liturgical poetry and, and, and a bunch of other things. So he does, he does have this kind of reception, but none of his manuscripts that I found um, are eliminated. So I, I, I didn't kind of go into that. But I, I do talk about him in the in the other article. Thanks. Um, so that's, I guess it's pretty fairly late uh, where these diagrams start to be uh, begin being used. It's all yeah. It doesn't go back before the 11th century. Um, but of course, like good sort of theologians in Byzantium, they're always looking at the patristics and saying, you know, sort of if they had diagrammed it, this is what they would have done. Um, and they're anchoring it in these, I mean, Brennius is reading Maximus Confessor and is saying this is how, and as you saw here, Theus is reading Pseudo-Athanasius, which, which is an early, um, early Christian text as well. So they're reading patristic sources um, and are deriving their diagrams from them and reading, you know, early Christian iconography, the, the, the symbolic depiction of the, the angels at Mamre, but this is basically what Eustratius' diagram would have looked like if, if it had been illustrated. So, all right. Um, okay, so I'll just circle back up here really quickly to that. Okay, so, all right. Um, so Theophanes. So as we kind of have already talked about at this point, he, he differs really from Nicaeus and Herotheus in a few important ways, uh, one of which obviously is just a simple format of his diagram, um, which is concentric circles, and it doesn't include um, a triangle, and his very strong Neoplatonism, which uh, if you saw sort of the source, sources, it's basically a few passages in Pseudo Dionysius. Um, and also what was interesting is how he builds up an argument from an analysis of the elementary principles of geometry and then kind of works his way up to more complex figures. So that was very different as well. Here, Theus has a couple of different ones. Nikitas has just one. Joseph Brinius, another guy I haven't talked about, has but just a few. But nobody has a series of 20 diagrams as well. So it also read much more like something that you would find in the Quadrivium or the basic school textbooks of Byzantium. Um, so the project really involved collating the three uh, manuscript witnesses, which are the Bodleian Grec 193, which is 14th century, the Moscow Grec um, 461, which is, the, which is illustrated, the Bodleian isn't illustrated. And then there's another Vatican manuscript, um, 2242, which was copied in 1443, basically underneath um, Basarian. And what, what was interesting about the Moscow manuscript too is that it has a very clear provenance. So there's a note in it that it was owned by one of the most important um, bibliophiles and teachers of people like Basarian and Gennadius Scalarius, um, John Hortus Minus. So it's, it has a very clear provenance in the capital right around the turn of the 15th century. So it was, it was being read by important individuals um, associated with this, with this um, intellectual John Hortus Minus. So the author, um, we already kind of briefly touched on it. Theophanes is Bishop of Nicaea. Uh, at this point, Nicaea was 
one of the few uh, sort of satellite states of the empire after the Fourth Crusade, among which were other ones like Epirus and the um, empire of Trebzon. He's very clearly reading Gregory Palamas, but as I try to argue in the introduction, he, he has certain views about the Eucharist and symbols and um, the divine light and creation, which, which don't square very well with um, Gregory Palamas. And this is something that people like Meyendorf have talked about. So I, I, I won't get too much into that. The text uh, seems to be written against an unedited treatise defending the filioque by Demetrius Cadonus, who with his brother Prochorus Cadonus is translating texts by um, um, Thomas Aquinas and using them to challenge uh, orthodox theologians in the 14th century. And the Cadonus brothers are, are well known for their very extensive Latin translation project, disseminating texts mainly by Aquinas and Augustine among um, monks on Mount Athos and, 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 and scholars in the capital and elsewhere. Um, and so also, as, we, as I've already mentioned, one of the things that's interesting about Theophanes as well is that he is relying, it seems, on John Vecos and specifically his epigraphoi to argue that the spirit relates, quote unquote, immediately and with the son to the archi, to the father, whereas the son relates directly and immediately. And that's just, you know, a simple reading of his concentric circles. Um, so I'll go through briefly uh, his, his sequence of diagrams, say a little bit about kind of the regress, and then I'll, I'll end talking about uh, it's important for art history. It's, it's important for art history and kind of what it helps us to see about mandorlas or circles of light around Christ and Byzantine iconography. So he, um, let's see. So he introduces a circle at the very beginning um, on the bottom left of your screen. And he talks about why it is a perfect uh, shape and why it's a symbol of eternity because it has neither a beginning nor an end. And then he introduces the other rectilinear shapes over on the right hand side. Um, which he says are less perfect because they have multiple angles. And he also at the very top on the right hand uh, folia uh, describes the circle as a symbol of heaven, whereas earth is a rectilinear figure. He introduces the theme of mystical contemplation using um, the center point and two concentric circles on the left hand side of your screen. And, and, and here he introduces the metaphor of a pebble falling in a pool of water and forming ripples, which, as I mentioned in the paper, also gets picked up by Latin theologians like Henry, Henry Sousa. Uh, on the right-hand side, he introduces the elements of the circle, a center point, a surface, and a circumference. And this type of demonstrative, very simple argumentation is, is, is indicative of the kind of school training in which he seems to be anchoring his, his argument. Then he argues that the circle uh, has an archi or a principle in its center point, but which he means that it arranges the circumference. So you literally draw a circle by uh, sticking the foot down in one point and then moving your finger around in a circle and completing it. So the the center point provides a taxis or the arrangement. And this word taxis, he hits on heavily because this is the same term order that pops up in the filioque debate. So all of those diagrams that I showed you before are all beginning from the premise of we need to explain the taxis or the order. So when he talks about taxis, this is a theologically freighted term that motivates every single one of these diagrams that I've showed you. Um, it's just their term for how you talk about the arrangement or order or schema of the Trinity. So when he says that the archi provides a taxis, he's saying that the father, to kind of you know, look ahead, the father determines everything else that he's going to draw. And he shows how the radii flow out of the center point to the circle, circumference fixing its limit. 
and so now he then begins to make his fil his filioque his argument against the filioque and he relates the point and the circles to the father the son and the holy spirit so, so the father is alpha the center point here on the left beta gamma delta is the sun circle and then epsilon zeta eta is the outer circle moving on the diagrams on the right hand side begin to talk about how we can talk about how we can explain their similarity and their difference which is i pointed out with the with the the Nikitas, uh diagram uh is motivating his argument for the for the not primary and primary senses of the extremes Theophanes has a different way of doing that, which is to rely on the radii to, to talk about their difference and their similarity. So he draws um, 24 radii for the sun and 12 for the spirit, noting that they all have the same center point. And so they're not temporally disparate or ontologically unequal, even though you might think that they would be if you're kind of taking this in a uh, natural philosophy, causal sense. Um, so that we have to kind of imagine this whole schema as sort of being instantaneously drawn. Although he does want to say that the Father causes the Son of the Spirit as the begetter of the Son and the processor of the Spirit. Um, but then he doesn't want to draw them as overlapping as he shows right here. And this is an interesting part in his argument where he, he sort of asked, well, can they be sort of just drawn as one and the same? But he thinks that would reduce their distinctions and that they need to be kept graphically distinct as two separate circumferences. So he sort of seems to anticipate an objection from his opponent who would say, well, if they are um, in some sense equal, why not just one circle? And that's his sort of argument against uh, that. Is it, it, it would risk calling them numerically identical. In other words, so he labels this one single circle with the six variables of uh, beta, gamma, delta, and epsilon, zeta, eta, and says we can't do it that way. This idea carries over to the next diagram where he kind of once again flirts with the identity of all three of these, where he says, quote unquote, the center point is a sort of contracted circle, whereas the circle is a sort of extended center point. And here, he literally draws the center as a um, very small circle, um, saying in some sense, I guess we can think about the father also as a circle. And as we point out, this is, this is where we kind of make a big deal about the idea of infinite regress, because the question arises then of, well, what's the center point of the father? What is archi for the archi? Um, and he doesn't have within the context of trying to clarify his understanding of the taxes or the order of the Trinity, he doesn't have any real reason to elaborate on that. But we do think that it is interesting insofar as other authors like Selos and John Italus had, had read Gregory Nazianzus as sort of raising the question of an infinite regress. And we talk about how Gregory says that the, the monad proceeds through the dyad and ends at the triad is the way to kind of think about um, Theophany's archi traveling through the sun, the mesos, and ending at the spirit, and then, you know, returning back is, is sort of an analogy, a visual analogy to this really complex phrase that led Pacellos and um, John Italus to, 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 to frame the Trinity as a sort of infinite regress. And for, for these guys, uh, they thought that you had to agree with Gregory of Nazianzus that the, the monad stops at the triad because it's the first number in Greek mathematics because the monad and the dyad are the principles of number um, and their understanding of mathematics because they're the, they're the elements by which you form numbers. So three is the sort of first set in the sense of a number that has only elements as its members and principles. So this is where we get into the idea of regress. And we can talk about that, um, I guess, in the Q&A, if you have more questions about that. The next two diagrams illustrate how the circles diverge from one another. And um, the sun relates to the spirit, to the father immediately and directly, whereas the spirit relates 
to the father immediately and with the son circle. So it has this extra relation, in other words, which is depicted graphically by its being uh, further out from the father. Um, the penultimate diagram explains that not only does the father process or serve as a principle for the son and spirit, but all of creation, which he symbolizes through these rectilinear figures of, uh, that are lying here on the edge of the spirit circumference, all of these created beings flow back into the archi through the spirit and sun. And then finally, in a way that's not unlike uh, some of the other Byzantine writers, he has an almost visionary moment at the end of his text where he says, and, and really we can, we can imagine this diagram as what Isaiah saw when he saw the angels around the throne of God and um, he shows eight rectilinear figures around the circumference of um, the spirit circle. And he's reading the passage in Isaiah and the Septuagint, which the Alexandrian translators uh, included a reference to, quote unquote, a circle. Although the Masoretic text of the Bible doesn't have this language of a circle, they included that and said that the angels must be in a circle around God. And for Theophanes, reading the Greek translation, that to him immediately says, this is the correct form. So once again, you have an author reading the biblical text for um, an affirmation of what he's doing graphically. So that's the end of the sequence there. Um, we can pause and talk about that. And maybe just if, if, if you all want, we can kind of go to some of the art historical examples uh, a little bit later. But um, Anything to talk about there? Well, yeah, I had one question, Justin, um, on the diagram where the father is a circle. Sorry. Um, because that's that seems to be what sets up the um, infinite regress problems that you're discussing. Where does that diagram, where does he get that diagram from? What's the motivation for understanding the center as itself a circle? Oh, so I think the, the easy answer would be to say, this is a poetic trope and that it does a pop up in certain poets who say, like I mentioned, I think in one of the footnotes, Christopher of M Middle Anias is looking at a spider web and he says, oh, and the, the center point is the tiniest of all circles. So this is a poetic trope, but I don't think that actually explains everything by any means. I think he's intrigued by ways of depicting the Trinity that somehow captures their perfect identity while at the same time realizing that drawing is a medium which fundamentally is all about difference and discursivity. And so the sort of perfect diagram would almost just be like a dot on the page. And he kind of starts with that. But then once you sort of start adding elements, it's in, well, how do you kind of keep collapsing the elements back into a unity? And, and, and that's kind of, you know, the reason for this whole title is, I think he's interested in how do you show identity through difference? And that's the sort of broad, broadest argument. So I think it is partly just a sort of philosophical mind trying to say, to, to qualify what he's done. And then it actually leads him to kind of interesting intellectual ideas about regress or about um, about how you conceptualize something that kind of eludes reason so does the the later diagram where the the center of the circle is itself a circle uh that's not a necessary um consequence of the earlier diagrams it's just something theophanes is saying i'm adding this to show that um there's some sort of impossibility at a diagram ever really getting at God's simplicity because um, there's sort of an infinite regress problem. Um, 
but um, I don't know. It just doesn't seem to connect with the earlier drawing where the, the father is the point. It's like, what's, what's the point of that, I guess? Um, if there's no real regress problem there, what's the use of bringing in a regress problem that's not connected to the earlier drawing? Does that make any sense? Yeah, I, th I think so. I think, so I guess partly, well, let me, let me approach the question from, from two angles, one of which is historical and the other of which is within simply the sequence of diagrams where this argument is coming from. So I think historically, it's important to note this language of contraction and expansion within the Trinity is very old and had, had, had been a questionable orthodoxy since really early on. And people like Maximus and others are like, you, you shouldn't apply this because it has spatializing uh, ramifications, which you might, which, which you definitely don't want to commit yourself to. And it also s potentially conflates the persons in a way that's unhelpful. So it's not coming out of nowhere. Where is it coming from within the sequence is, I think he's thinking about, okay, if we, if we isolate the father's archie and show how it generates the circles because it's the principle by which you use to draw the circles, he then wants to ask, well, in what sense then is, and he uses the language of prototype, in what sense then is, is, is the tupos or figure of the circle simply a reflection of its prototype? And that, you might have to say, well, in some sense, I guess the circle is like its center point. And then if you're thinking very visually, you might just sort of say, well, then I guess the circle is a tupos, like its prototype, in the sense of it is kind of just like a small circle. So I think he is using visual terms, which go back to iconophile theology, of saying an icon is like its prototype in the sense that the depiction looks like the person, and so the circle looks like its center point, and that it's just a sort of expansion in which case the circle is the sort of contraction. So I don't think from a fascia, it's, it's, it, it's, it's odd within the context of him arguing for a ripple on a pool of water expands out and forms circles. So in some sense, that first moment of contact is sort of already a circle, even though it can't really be causally because it has to kind of be that from which everything that has quote unquote extension emerges. So it can't be itself extension. And yet he kind of working with this prototype idea, I think, and metaphors kind of broaches that idea and just says it out loud. And it is true that it had been deemed heretical, which once again kind of makes him an odd figure and maybe kind of says, this is why nobody else did this. Um, but I, I don't know if that's an adequate explanation, but that's kind of historically and within the sequence where I think this problem is being generated. Justin, I was wondering. I, oh, sorry, Marcus. Yeah, you got it. Yeah. Sure. Thanks. Um, so, is the the reasoning that motivates this kind of a uh, development of these diagrams and theophanies is based on a uh, Platonic, Neoplatonic metaphysics? Is the the reasoning something like if you can understand the nature of the circle and how it relates to the center and what develops out of that, that you can sort of reason back to the trinity itself because the circle is just an image in some sense of the ultimate cause is that the underlying reasoning i think so and, and i think it does go back to these passages um that he's reading in studinesius i mean i i, I take the Athenians to be um like sincere i don't i i don't read him um in a negative or sort of cynical light or, you know, you know, that's why I sort of almost hesitate to even say he knew these other diagrams because I feel like if he had, he would have engaged with them. But I, I really think he is reading um, Pseudo-Dionysius and trying to kind of come up with a way to graphically depict uh, the Trinity and, uh, so it's, and it's uh, those passages in, this, in, in the divine names, I think. So it's very different from how, um... I don't know how like I might use a diagram 
in a class or something. I might mm. use a diagram just because it's convenient, it just happens to uh, illustrate the point I'm making. But with this way of thinking, it's not just convenient, it actually reflects reality. That's the idea. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I think you're putting your finger on a really difficult question because at moments it seems like he's really just saying this is like a heuristic. But when he gets to the visionary language of like Isaiah's vision, you're like, man, that looks a lot like paintings of the eight angels in the dome of Byzantine churches, which is not just sort of like a heuristic. It's almost like this is in the scripture. This is a prophetic vision and my diagrams tapping into that. Mm -hmm. When he gets to kind of these types of, of, of arguments, you're sort of wondering, is this kind of like a heuristic? So I think he's kind of moving in and out. And, and, and this is something which I think is kind of frustratingly medieval about some of these authors is that they they seem to want to be just a heuristic i'm just saying this is this is just a way to think about something we can't really think about but then they verge into visionary experiences and that feels very different so i think i think he's kind of doing he's moving across different zones of what vision and uh, a graphic representation is and, and when he gets to this sort of mystical contemplation of like the circle is the most perfect form and it really kind of is like a symbol of Trinity, you're, you're, you're sort of verging on like um, a theology of geometry or geometric theology, maybe. Um, I mean, it sounds like you're saying uh, Dionysius is one of the chief sources for this um notion of uh, remaining, processing, and returning. Um, and I'm, I'm guessing that you're going to say that the Dionysian source that Theophanes is using is reflecting Proclus and the Neoplatonic scheme of remaining, proceeding, and returning. Is that right? Yeah, I think to the extent that, like in this in the second section of the paper, I kind of talk about how the concentric circles format is used, albeit with different terminology of of mind, intellect, and and, and soul in 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 in, in Plotinus and Proclus. You might think that Theophanes has these people in his pocket, although he's he's doing something different. He's applying it to the Trinity which they weren't. Pseudo Dionysius isn't applying it to the Trinity, he's applying it to the divine intellects. And I think this is once again, just part of the reception is they're, they're finding modes of argument that they take out of the context. It's not sort of complete cherry picking, but it is, he's taking an argument about the circular and spiral movements of the divine intellects and he's applying it to the Trinity, which isn't there in the divine names, but those are the texts that he's, you know, 100% hitting on. Whether or not he knows them from a florilegium or something, it's not clear, but it I seems think, like, sorry. No, no, yeah, I, I think it, he is using kind of Plotinus and Proclus and to, to that degree. So insofar as Dionysius has this uh, flowing out and returning framework, um, Mm -hmm. I know he talks about God as love, God as, you know, the good, the beautiful, God as love, and he talks about um, God flowing through the entire hierarchy of the universe and then flowing back. Uh, from what I gathered, that whole process of God's motion, his circular motion out and then back, was referring to God as the good, rather than God in his Trinitarian processions, because Dionysius doesn't really explicitly say this is referring to the Trinitarian processions. So insofar as Theophanes is lifting this idea of God as the good and God as love, processing out into all creation and returning, and applying that to the, Trini the Trinity, that seems to get at what you're saying with a potential heresy or the, you know, condemnations of heresy, where um, 
the hypostatic uh, property of the father seems to just be this point, like the Neoplatonic one that just flows out into some kind of determinacy and then there's a return back to the point. Um, so would that be an accurate portrayal of, of uh, maybe a critique from a dogmatic sort of orthodox standpoint of what he's doing? He's sort of misusing Dionysius? Yeah, well, so let me say, before I kind of answer that, let me say, I think cannot be ignored the what the precise context of every one of the diagrams that I've showed you today is. And that is authors trying to defeat Latin theologians at their own game. If really before the 11th century, there aren't any diagrams of the Trinity, other than just sort of very simple, like we're gonna symbolize the Trinity as like three circles which is you know, kind of what I do at the end of the paper is to go back and kind of say, how would somebody like Theophanes have read these? That's about the extent of what you have in Byzantium. It's a much different story if you go into the Latin tradition where there's much more of uh, a heuristic understanding of graphic representation. Um, this kind of gets back to Marcus's point is the Latins didn't have this iconic sense of the image they had a much more either a didactic sense or be a sort of devotional sense, not icon iconicity, which is a prototype type relationship. So I think it's telling that all of these are Greek Latin debates, Greek Latin polemics. And the Greeks seem to be saying, you're going to give me this diagram. Well, if you're going to, if you're going to diagram, this is how you should do it. And they may not quite realize that, they're committing themselves to kind of a conceptual framework, which might be fundamentally at odds with other very prominent theologians, some of whom rise much more to prominence later, like Maximus Confessor was, he has a very big late Byzantine reception. He's not much read um, before that, but he becomes very, very important. And so does Pseudodionysius. Um, so I think that, is one way to say, to kind of frame the issue is this is this is Greeks trying to trying to one up their opponents, and maybe um, reading them in that light allows you to say to read them a, a little bit more favor, favorably as kind of <laughs> I don't know, um, turning their hands to kind of you know get rid of get rid of the bad argument, but then maybe sort of committing themselves in the and the process to, to, to some basic forms of argument that they might not want to in the long run. But I don't know. That's the sort of layman's. I'm not a sort of Greek. Uh, I'm not a sort of scholar of, 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 of Byzantine theology, but that is my sense, having read all these different kind of homilies, is there always, there always a quote unquote polemical context as kind of Jack was asking about. And I think that's important to keep in mind. They're all trying to kind of come up with a better diagram than their opponent. But it is interesting that people like Max, Maxim Grecker just like, you shouldn't diagram at all. And I think, you know, post-Byzantine, that's a kind of interesting read, is this whole project is just sort of <laughs> wrong-headed. But he still says, like, if you're going to do it, then you should at least just flip it right side up. Where he's just like, well, why would you even say that if the whole thing just doesn't make any sense? It's, uh, and so you sort of get the, get the sense that maybe that's kind of the tone of a lot of these things. So do you think the the refutation of the filioque, if that's sort of the primary focus and um, ignoring the problems that might uh, come out of this way of doing things. Could you explain again what the exact refutation is? From what I gathered, uh, from what I was reading, the, the uh, a circle cannot be a principle of a, another circle, so like the the in the inner circle that's that symbolizes the mm -hmm. sun in this concentric circle diagram. The inner circle could not be the principle of the outer circle because the principle is the point. Yeah. So that goes against the filioque argumentation, which wants to say that the Holy Spirit uh, proceeds from 
the Father and the Son as if from one principle, I think is how it's put at times. Yeah. So no. this diagram is trying to say, no, the only principle is the point, that's the Father. And so when you see how the Spirit is somehow the outer circle, which manifests through the inner circle, don't get in your mind that that means that it's caused or that the inner circle is the principle. And so if that's, for, so for one, is that the only reputation of the Filioque going on here? And two, um, well, I guess I was wondering, does that um, commit us to, I guess what I was saying earlier, that the father is just um, this point that uh, it seems like it's not capturing his hypostatic uniqueness um, and he's just sort of expanding in, in a sense of a Neoplatonic emanation, but. Yeah. Yes. So your, your reading of how this is an argument of the filioque is exactly right. I mean, you said it nicely. So you can read the sun as mesos, as mean, in the sense of a dia, a through, the, the spirit processes through the mesos, but not ek from. And that's exactly right, because there's only one archi for both of them. And so that, that's, you know, this is sort of the same kind of fork diagram that you get in Mark of Ephesus, is that there's one R key and there's two results. For Theophanes, he's just putting those into uh, concentric circles. But, but that's, that's the argument against the Filioque. Um, it's a concession in the sense that he accepts that the mesos does serve as a through for the, for the, for the spirit, which, you know, when you go back to those triangular diagrams, you might think, well, actually, it's kind of better that you just sort of leave it off here because you can say it's through and that you can get to the spirit through the sun, but you can also just get to it directly. So there's a sort of direct immediacy and an indirect immediacy. So in some sense, those triangular diagrams are a little bit better in preserving the uniqueness of um, the spirit's also immediacy, whereas he sort of, you, you can't you can't do it except for that you have to say yeah there's still this immediate immediate this this immediate relation and that it's 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 just uh from the same archie as the sun is but you do have this sort of spatial sense and i think that's what he wants to capture but that is a sort of concession that some theologians would have said no you can't do that so he is a complicated figure for that reason yeah. can i just ask one question about so when it comes to um like the geometrical grounding of some of these um, conceptions, these Trinitarian conceptions, is um, the notion that the um, the circle of the sun, that inner circle, uh, that circle is is the circle through which the spirit circle is manifested, right? Is that grounded at all in the Euclidean context? Because obviously, you know, the notion that the that that the, the father is the arche, you know, that's grounded in a Euclidean geometrical sense because, you know, it seems like we can establish just in a geometrical sense that the point is the principle of the circle. But I I wasn't sure. Is the notion that like, yeah, the third the the, the outer circle of the spirit is being manifested through the sun? Is that, 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 that if, am I right that that's not really being grounded in a geometrical notion? That's more just like, if you look at it, it appears as though, anyway, do you see my question? Yeah, I think that's right. I don't, I don't think he makes an, an argument that's, that's, that's he could in for that at all. Okay. Um, one other thing though, further on the Euclidean uh, stuff, like, um, Obviously, you know, you're talking about like, this is, in some sense, you know, maybe it's, it's just illustrative or didactic. But on the other hand, um, and, and forgive me, I, I'm not uh, familiar enough with uh, Euclid, uh, but you do point out that like, you know, uh, just as in Euclid, you go from uh, point, line, surface, mm -hmm. circle, to rectilinear, rectilinear figures. So too in Theophanies, you go from point to line and circle and then ending with the, the shapes. So I'm just wondering like, 
I mean, could he respond to the triangular diagrams and be like, look, like the triangle presupposes these other geometrical mm. um, notions. And therefore, like to make, to, to construe the triangle as like the primary diagram mm. of, of God, qua absolute source of all, like it, it really just, it's just not grounded in a, in a Euclidean sense. Whereas like at least the circular diagrams um, seem to be having more rigorous Euclidean foundation, if that uh, makes sense. Sorry. No, I think you're putting your finger on something really unique and interesting, which is, again, why I think this, this, this argument needs to be seen as unique in that, yes, he tries not to presuppose anything and comes up with a diagram, which is, in a way, a diagram of all of reality, which none of the other diagrams do and i think that that's partly the the problems that carson was raising earlier are generated by he seems to kind of like outdone himself in making a filioque argument and that he's just going to kind of explain everything in existence along the way and when he gets to this prohodos and epistrophe argument it's 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 a it's a really ambitious project and it does sort of start from like here here's the elemental principles and it does follow that kind of analytic line of argument that that because he kind of takes this this Proclan natural philosophy kind of monad argument and applies it to Trinity, he ends up kind of explaining the generation of of of, of everything and everything sort of final calls back in the archie along the way. But um, whether or not he kind of oversteps his boundary in doing that, I think it's, a, it's an open question, but it does, I think, kind of come from a philosophical ambition to, to not take anything for granted and, 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 and to say, like, well, let's just really think about the point and how you can generate everything from the point and how the point is the final cause and that to which everything returns. So I think there is, a, there is an elegance to the argument that, that quite simply you don't find in the the other ic uh, more ic iconic diagrams that, 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 that people like Kirithes read as like icons. Yep. In, in along those lines, is it a potential like geometrical problem that, yeah, the circle um, has its arche in the point, but it also mm -hmm. has its arche in a line. Like you, you need a point, but then you also need a line. So it seems like, um, actually, that for that first circle of the sun, um, it's not just relying on the father qua point, but you also need a line. I mean, I, do you, I think you might address this with the flowing point, but at any mm. rate, I'm just kind of curious about that. Like, is that like a kind of uh, geometrical hiccup here? <laughs> yeah, no, I think so. And I think one of, the, one of the questions that I still have is exactly what are all these radii doing? But yeah, I think it does. It does presuppose um, surface, which he doesn't, he doesn't really problematize the concept of surface very much, um, even though he labels it. And he doesn't really kind of problematize these triangles that he talks about, which, uh, you know, you might kind of think, well, he could do some interesting things with like the primary and not primary sense of that and how exactly they relate. So yeah, I, I, I share that kind of sense that, um, the line might be a problem for him, except in that he does try to sort of say like these are the these are the emanations out, and so he does seem to kind of read those as like emanations. And if you kind of grant him that, then you might you might think that he kind of in the, insofar as those are talked and sort of talked about in pseudo Dionysius just and talked with the sort of like straight lines or radii out that he's you can kind of allow him that by his sources, but his sources don't take Euclid as serious as he does either. So. Yeah, which I wonder if that's has to do maybe with his like, Pro, I mean, Proclus wrote a commentary on Euclid, so I wonder if mm -hmm. his seriousness about Euclid had to do with that. But I also I wanted to ask, um, do do you want to delve in more now into the issue of the formal regress problem, or should we wait on that, or is that okay to talk a little more? Yeah, about? yeah, yeah, no. Yeah, because I I thought one of the more fascinating aspects of your paper was so. So you're like you were talking about, you know, um, um, 
you know, if you allow the RK, if you allow uh, the father to just remain a point, um, then you don't seem to get this, uh, this, this regress problem. But he wants to establish more of an ontological equality, it seems like, between the persons. And thus, he says, you know, you can actually think of the point as a contracted uh, circle, right? But if you have a circle, obviously, uh, <laughs> if the father's a circle, then he needs a point. And if that mm -hmm. is secretly a circle, then that needs a point of that, you know, and, and so forth. And you get the infinite regress problem that you talked about. Um, but you, you kind of have a really interesting interpretation where you're like, well, okay. And correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like your interpretation was like, okay, yeah, you could look at this as like a, an error or, a, you know, a, a, a kind of a hiccup in Theophanes's, um, uh, diagrams, or you could think of this infinite regress as a sort of something that Theophanes might have um, almost uh, um, affirmed in a certain way, insofar as it has this, this ex expressive power that you talk about, this expressive potential to convey just how uh, infinite and um, incomprehensible the Godhead really is because not only is the Godhead, as you put it, like not only is the Godhead just, you know, uh, beyond uh, the beings that he creates, like as a, like a higher rung of reality, he's actually the beyond of the beyond of the beyond. Like it's, it's just a never ending uh, beyond in a certain way. So anyway, I, I was mm -hmm. just, you could talk a little bit more about that, that very interesting turn in your argument. Um, Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think this is this is partly the appeal of people like Pseudodinesis to, to to Byzantine theologians, and um, that is my particular reading of this moment in his argument. Which, again, it's not something he thematizes, but I I think he he wrote a whole treatise on the creation of the world, so he's very aware of ways that people talk about the archie. And so it's, it's just hard to imagine that he wouldn't have noticed this moment in his argument as being a place that opens him up to either a critique on the grounds of his you know, diagram being just sort of mistaken or an error, or that it, that it contributes something to the, the devotional aspect of his theology. And I think that, that that's ultimately where it kind of come down on this is that it it's it's more a moment where he allows for within concepts and concepts that he gives a graphic expression to a sort of moment of withdrawal of the godhead is sort of this concealing is that if it's going to reveal itself as circle it's also going to then sort of contract once again back into this this punctum, this hidden mystery. And so I think that is the point of mystery in his diagram. Um, uh, without question is how do you conceptualize the archi? And he's always sort of, you know, sort of taking it out with the radii or he's generating the rectilinear figures through those and then talking about how everything kind of comes back to it. But I do think it is this point of tension both in his argument at this particular point that you're drawing attention to, but also conceptually um, within the kind of longer philosophical tradition of how, how do you understand the first principle? And just given that he is you know, an author of a treatise on creation, he, he has to be aware of that. Hugh, I think you brought up uh, Italos and Celos. I think maybe Italos had an argument about the regress. And I think it related to Gregory of Nazianzus, who had the quotation, or who they quote, referring to the monad um, is somehow um, experiences an uproar within itself, and it comes to be a dyad, and then it comes to a halt at the triad. And then I think there's a certain way of reading Gregory about what in the world he means by that, which leads to this um, way of thinking about the unity or the monad in terms of our way of experiencing it and our finite minds, which can never really get at the in itself 
nature of the Trinity. Mm-hmm. And it seems to me like that way of reading Gregory then leads you to the more modest, like, oh, this is all a symbol. This is all just an apathetic sort of way of expressing my devotion, where the kind of unity that we can get at is only this beyond of a beyond of a beyond. But I think you brought up Italos's reading of, of, of that as, as to, I think you refer to it as a henoses or some sort of a um, reading of Gregory as not referring to the monadic principle in itself, but our way of thinking about it. Um, could you maybe explain a little bit of that? Um, because I think that's important for getting at whether Theophanes is aiming at this procline metaphysics, which is supposed to be illustrating the absolute ground of all existence. Like, as you were saying, he gives an explanation of all creation or whether this is only our sort of finite mode of using concepts. So we're using like these geometrical concepts, which are inherently limited and lead to this apophatic regress problem. That seems like a sort of a tension that's going on. And when you refer to someone like Italos, who's very influenced by Proclus and Neoplatonic metaphysics, as himself giving the argument for this infinite regress, which is supposed to represent the more devotional, humble point of view, I think that really gets at the tension there. So I wonder if you could maybe correct my sort of attempt at um, reading that problematic. So just to make sure I understand, are you, you're asking about the the tension of Italus who takes a more intellectual approach to the regress, whereas Theophanes takes a more devotional approach? Is that the tension? No, from what I remember, and I could be remembering wrong, um, Italus formulates the regress problem. And I thought it was connected back to a reading of Gregory of Nazianzus. Yeah. I could be wrong on whether he was... Okay, yeah. Okay, so I think, so one thing to say is the, the, the text that they're reading by Gregory, that the monad proceeds through the dyad and ends at the triad, this exact language also gets mapped out on Trinitarian diagrams. Um, so some that I didn't show you by Joseph Brinius in, early, in the early 15th century. So this language is part and parcel of, of the response to Latin theologians on the one hand in polemical contexts and also a way to arrive at a formal reading of the relation between the persons, which in some cases leads people to make diagrams. So the Italus passage is uh, in particular interested in like how theologians have understood the mesos or the middle. And what I was trying to talk about there with, with, with Italus and Pacellus is that they view the passage in John that the Father is greater than me as defining the Father principally as the archi and that the archi proceeds to a lower term always through the through a middle, and that for him, that's the dyad. And this is a formal version, this is a formal reading of the Trinity that these authors draw on mathematics to generate a a formal reading of the Trinity in the same way structurally that Theophanes draws on mathematics to generate a formal reading of the Trinity. And they both structurally hinge on how you understand the mesos, I think. So that's what we're trying to do. And it's, 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 it's an attempt to say, how do we understand Theophanes against the historical backdrop of formal readings, even though they're not, Theophanes isn't reading Gregory of Nazianzus to, to generate his problematic of, or to generate his, 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 his diagram. But we can see structural parallels in the way that they think about the middle and the mesos, and that's really what that's trying to do is set them within an intellectual trajectory that, 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 that ends in regress and that comes from how they understand the causal principle in relation to a middle.